Okay, now I want to talk about um, osmoregulation and excretion, basically the kidneys and how they're important in um, maintaining homeostasis, keeping the fluid levels in our body nice and stable. Before we get to the kidneys, let's talk about a couple other things. So, um, come back to that slide in a second. So, in aquatic organisms, depending on whether they live in salt or fresh water, they have um, different situations they need to deal with. So, what happens with a saltwater fish? So, a saltwater fish is basically living in a hypertonic environment, so that fish will lose water through osmosis. Okay. What are they going to get the, to regain that water? Well, they have to drink the seawater. Okay, now the seawater, of course, has a lot of salt and other ions in it. What are they going to do? They're going to use their gills to excrete some of that excess salt. And they tend to urinate not so much because they want to retain that water. However, in a freshwater fish, this is a situation a little different. They tend to absorb water because the fish is hypertonic now relative to its surroundings. So they tend to take in a lot of water. Of course, they take up some water when they're feeding. Um, but what do they do? They're able to excrete large amounts of urine because for them, taking in water is not a problem. Um, so that's the general situation for these fish. Now there are some fish, like tilapia, which is the one that we typically eat at in the dining hall when we have fish, that are quite adaptable and they can live in um, either very salty or, or, or relatively salty and also fresh water. Um, certain fish like salmon are able to do this as well. They're able to switch between the two types of systems. Now some, though I haven't looked at this in great detail, but I assume certain types of saltwater fish and freshwater fish really don't do well in the other situation just because they don't have the adaptations to do that. Other Organisms that live, um, uh, you know, in coastal areas have ways of dealing with this, is, uh, with, with this salt as well. So here this seagull. Seagulls sometimes only have a, uh, access to salt water, so they drink that salt water. What, what do they do with the excess salt? Well, they have these glands that are able to extract salt from their bloodstream and excrete a concentrated salt solution from their na nasal passages and so that's one way they deal with it. <clears throat> now another thing that animals need to deal with are nitrogen wastes that are formed through metabolic processes. Um, aquatic organisms, particularly those um, freshwater fish, are able to just excrete large amounts of urine and what they do is they excrete it as in the form of ammonia. Um, <clears throat> however, ammonia can be relatively toxic if, it, if the levels of it begin to build up, and so terrestrial organisms don't do this because if they excreted it as ammonia, they would have to urinate a whole lot, and they don't want to do that because they want to conserve that water. And so what they do is they convert it, in the case of animals like us, to this compound called urea, which is a lot less toxic, and it's um, found in our urine. Others, like birds, convert it to this uric, uric, uric acid, which um, is found in bird droppings. It's a sort of a semi-solid material. Um, birds basically don't urinate. They just have this one type of waste material that comes out of them that is rich in uric acid. Okay, now let's look at the mammalian kidney. So, um, here we are. We have... Um, Here's the aorta up here and this large artery coming down and there's some branches coming off it. There's basically renal arteries that run into our kidneys and there's renal veins that run back out. So these renal arteries converge or the, the renal artery branches out into smaller and smaller arteries that spread throughout the kidney and what they do is they go to the nephrons and the nephrons are found in this part of the kidney. They extend from sort of the outer layer to the inner layer of the kidney from the cortex into the medulla. And so the blood that's flowing in is basically 
runs into this thing called uh, this cluster of capillaries called the glomerulus, which is surrounded by Bowman's capsule, and the blood pressure forces some of the liquid or some of what's called the filtrate out of the blood into the Bowman's capsule and into the proximal tube, then the loop of Henle, the distal tube, and then the collecting duct. Now, you'll notice that blood vessels also surround these tubes, particularly the loop of Henle. And what happens is some of that liquid that is sort of filtered out is reabsorbed. Particularly a lot of water is reabsorbed back into the circulatory system that then leaves the uh, kidney. So what happens along the way is, with the, particularly with the reabsorption of the water, that solution becomes more concentrated, has more solutes, and it particularly wastes solutes, extra solutes we don't need. And by the time the liquid is leaving the collected duct, it's much more concentrated in solutes than what was squeezed out of the blood. And so here we see what's being reabsorbed. Certain nutrients are being taken up out of the uh, nephron back into the cells that surround the nephron and back into the, into the circulatory system. A lot of water as well, certain salts, um, and a little bit of urea as well, perhaps, depending on how much there is. So you can see this is what's sort of squeezed out, and some of it is reabsorbed, and some of it leaves. Now, why is the water reabsorbed? Because you see it's passive diffusion. Well, what happens is you go from the uh, cortex into the medulla of the kidney, these cells that surround the nephron have more and more solutes in them. And so that basically draws the water out. Some energy is used to retain some of the salts. And so by the time you get to the end, you can see this solution is really concentrated in solutes relative to what came in. So that is the osmolarity of the solution changes. That is, the amount of solutes has changed significantly. So the kidneys help us retain this water and get rid of these waste solutes. If we happen to have drunk a lot of water, we won't retain quite as much, and the allergic urine will be more alert. If we're dehydrated, the urine will be more concentrated because the kidney will focus on retaining that water. And so this is kind of how that happens. So if you're thirsty, or I'm sorry, if you're dehydrated, what happens is you produce um, this, well, what happens is, so in your blood, um, when the osmolarity of the blood increases, that is the amount of water in the plasma is decreasing because you're dehydrated and the amount of solutes in the blood is increasing, that stimulates the production of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. What that does is it causes the nephrons to reabsorb more water and get that water back into the circulatory system such that you maintain homeostasis in the circulatory system and you don't have too many solutes floating around in your blood. It also stimulates uh, the thirst and you will hopefully then find some water to drink. Another way this system is influenced is also with blood pressure. So if blood pressure decreases, that means there's not quite as much enough liquid floating around in your bloodstream. And so there's this structure, um, as you can see, close to the glomerulus. And what it does is it stimulates production when that blood pressure decreases called renin, which carries, carries out a signal, a series of reactions here that um, causes the arteries, the smaller arteries to constrict, which can help increase the blood pressure. And it also stimulates reabsorption of water in the kidney, which combined should hopefully bring up your blood pressure. So both of those are ways in which the kidneys are influenced by the conditions in your body to, in both cases, retain more water um, because you're either thirsty or you just have low blood pressure. Okay, that's it.
Thanks.